welcome back everybody hope everything is all well um of course sam how are you feeling with your broncos on by this week oh uh, i've fully been able to recover my energy <laughs> from that chiefs game and so now i can like have proper energy levels for this week <clears throat> can't if you don't remember last time i was i was a bit tired but it was obviously just because you know took so much out of me and so now the bye week has given myself a bye week in terms of energy recovery, um, and I'm ready now. <laughs> You're telling me yesterday I went. Uh, I fell fast asleep right after work. Next thing I know, when I get up, it's 1 a.m. in the morning, and I missed the Chargers of the Jets game. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't have nothing to do until work today, but that was fun. Um, and of course, you, what a wacky week this week was. Um, who would have thought, like. The Texans game was like extremely wild. We got to CJ Stroud and the Houston receiving weapons later. But how about Dar- uh, Dario Ogumbawali? <laughs> Coming in oh, clutch yeah. for his kicker. <laughs> Kick of the 29 yard go ahead field goal mm-hmm. um, to help his team in that comeback effort. That is like unbelievable. <laughs> um, just want to give a shout out to him. Not many mm-hmm. running backs step up like that and can kick yeah. on 30, almost 30 yards oh. like that. So props to Dario Ogumbawali, yeah. man. Yeah, and he was doing kickoffs too, and I'm like, he's kicking it far, and I thought that was pretty cool. Wow, he's like, CJ Stroud was at, like, as is doing enough. He he deserved to have somebody help him out. So, <laughs> um, before we get into that, we we got a bunch of games we'd like to cover. Um, NBA episodes should be out later this week as well. Um, trying to get those uploads streamlined as quick as possible, so um, that that way you have double the content. But for now, we're going to start with the Texans, um, not the Texans, we'll get to the Texans later. Um, we're mm-hmm. going to talk about the Steelers and the Titans. Um, close game in this one. Um, really didn't know what to expect going going into it, but Steelers managed to pull out the win here. I believe they win 20 to 16. So, um, of course, Sam, did you have any thoughts about like recapping this game and uh, what you saw? Um, no, I thought it was funny. I think you texted me saying like, Wow, Matt Canada can finally call offense. And then literally after that drive, the Steelers looked so awful. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, my gosh. Like, I hope, like, you know, the first drive is always, like, the most scripted drive as well of, like, yeah. uh, of the game where you have, like, the, you have the least amount of, like, strategies because your team's been practicing all week. <clears throat> and, like, if that's the only good drive you can get, I'm like, bro, no way. But um, on the other side, I know the, tit- the Titans lost, but uh, Will Levis still looked pretty good um obviously I, I mean the Steelers defense obviously is like has a lot of key playmakers um but despite you know pocket collapsing and whatnot I thought he looked relatively composed he was still out there trying to make plays he seemed like he was able to read the defense despite you know short time a uh, time window to, to throw the football but uh I like this as a second game for him yeah um quick analysis that's good um I thought it was interesting how they pointed out that cat Ma- uh, got the cat in the bag already. But Matt Canada, not Cat Manada. <laughs> that, that's what my brain was thinking there. Um, but Matt Canada was sitting in the booth for pretty much all of his entire play calling tenure since he took over for the Steelers. And I thought it was interesting during the game. He was actually on the field, like being engaged with the offense, like calling plays, seeing it from the field level. I really thought that made a huge difference in the play calling, like at least that first drive. Like, next couple drives, you're kind of like, okay, Titans have a really good defense, so like part of it is like, okay, they can get pressure on the quarterback. I'm like, can you pick it? Like, do you have some overthrows you can't coach? Like, you just have to, like, hit those throws. And, like, he had a couple of them where it's like, the safety's right behind that. That's a pick six going the other way, like, <laughs> type, type deal. So, like, I don't think it's all on Matt Canada. Just watching the Steelers for the first time, like go against the Titans. But the biggest thing I realized, and I absolutely hated it when I dropped all my Najee Harris shares, is like they call a good, pretty good run game for Najee Harris and Jalen Warren. Mm-hmm. Like, that was really, I did not expect that. They called a lot of good double teams. They got like Najee some room where he's not getting stuffed in the backfield every time, and they did a really good job of like utilizing motions. And I. Did not expect to see that out of the Steelers offense. Mm-hmm. Now, on the other side, if you guys remember from last week, I cautioned against buying into the Will Levis hype. Because, sure, 
when it's like man on man and you got DeAndre Hopkins, like you got the parking lot of a window to get to hit him. Like so, there's a lot of room there where Will Levis has margin for errors, and Will Levis is really good at man coverage and like deep throws. He could execute that perfectly, but you saw a little bit from the Steelers like when they could just rush for and get to him, like that was a little bit more challenging and even more so what I'm looking to see like after his next six starts or maybe um, over these next couple of weeks, how defenses decide to play him because a lot of young quarterbacks struggle when you change the pitcher as a defense, like when pre-snap to post-snap, like you don't, you don't line up and just play as a defense. You like change up the looks on purpose. So maybe it goes from like cover two to man coverage or like cover two to cover three, maybe cover four to Tampa two, something like that. Where it's just you, in real time, you got like two or three seconds to recognize the coverage if the pass rush hasn't got to you yet. So that's a part of Will Levis's game that I feel like still like unanswered yet. And from college, he's had weaknesses targeting the intermediate routes of the field. So I'm curious to see what if the what if the defense calls cover three where they're still like preventing the deep throws and they're zoning in on like flat routes or like drag routes, like short throws that are easy to make. And they're cutting off like the sh- short and deep throws. Can Will Levis hit it in the pockets? Can, even in cover two, can he hit the sideline in that like small window intermediate like 10 to 15 yards down the field? That like only the best QBs can do it. If you can do that, I've been completely wrong on the Will Levis train all of a sudden. But if he starts to struggle, watch these defensive coordinators start to take notice and like copycat like each other week after week and see him struggle in those areas. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, I mean, but overall, yeah, for his first two games, uh, he's looked about as good as I feel like a lot of people could only expect and hope for. He's a better than Tannehill. Uh, <clears throat> mm-hmm. Well, Tannehill, he had an awful start to the season, too. Like, yeah. two touchdowns, six interceptions, or something like that. Like, And Will Levis had, like, two touchdowns already in this first start, which is ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, Malik Wills probably looked better in, like, whatever playtime he had just running the ball. <laughs> but, <clears throat> yeah. All right, cool. Let's get to the Dolphins and the Chiefs. Highly anticipated matchup. Um First half did not go as I expected. It was like a complete route. Like Tyreek had a bad fumble <laughs> that mm-hmm. contributed to it. And that proved to be the difference in the game, really. Like, if not mm-hmm. for that, like I think the Dolphins are right up there with the Chiefs. If I'm a Dolphins fan, I am not mad at all by the score. You had a hobble Jalen Waddle. Like Chiefs defense is a really good defense. And despite that, you were still able to run the ball. Don't forget, they still do not have Devon H uh Achan. Um, mm-hmm. I think that's how you say his last name now. Um, they still don't have Achan, and he makes a huge difference in that running attack. And you could see some of the sort of, sort of plays they called in the running game were different from when Achan was on the field. Like, I was hoping they would kind of use like Raheem Moster in that Achan role, maybe Jeff Wilson as like the inside guy because Jeff Wilson can do those inside runs well. Um, and Moster still has the speed to run approximately what A-Chan can do on the outside runs. But they only called that play, like, uh, the A-Chan type plays twice for, like, Mostert and Wilson. So I think it's really, like, they want A-Chan back on the field before they call plays like that. So mm-hmm. that had to do with a lot of, like, why the Dolphins running game is stymied. But, like, credit the Chiefs defense. I think, like, if we had to rank top three defenses in the NFL right now, it's hard to rule out the 49ers. But objectively... I would probably say it's Cleveland, Baltimore, and Kansas City like as the top three defenses. So, like, if I'm the Dolphins, yeah, it looks bad that you scored 14 points against the Chiefs. But, like, Chiefs have, like, a top five defense this year. They're absolutely insane. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah. Um, I thought it was kind of a funny game in terms of, like, it really was each half a team was kind of looking good <clears throat> in terms of, uh, you know, Kansas City up like 21-0 basically at half and looking the like Dolphins they're gonna walk away with for it. A full half. It was ridiculous. Yeah, and like yeah, so I was like I, like it really came down to that last drive. Like in a way, the, it wasn't a close game, but at the, 
in the same time, it was a very close game. Just with when each team each team decided to, to score on offense, and so uh, and Tua the missed a guy really too. close. Yeah, like Tua had a wide open guy. He just missed. Like I think he had Waddle wide open. Down yeah, the I field. think I saw that. And he didn't see. And too. he didn't see that read. It would have been a tied game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so yeah, I mean, there's a few things that you know. I mean, I think both sides could hope to have touched up during the game, but. Uh, obviously, Kansas City got the win, so they're happy with that. And then the Dolphins, just because they lost here, doesn't you know put them out of contention by any means. I think, I mean, they're still you know leading their own division. Uh, and based on how the Bills have been playing, it doesn't seem like uh, the Bills have a lot of opportunity to catch up. Uh, I mean, just Dolphins are playing out of their minds right now. Just overall, like losses come here and there, but. Uh, they're winning when they need to, which ends, which I think will end up leading the Dolphins to win the division for the uh, for this season. Not only that, dude, I, they did a really good job on Kelsey too. There's a lot of good mm-hmm. things the Dolphins did. They're one of the few like personnel teams that can actually match up to like what Kelsey brings to the table, mm-hmm. and like the sky's the limit on that team. Do you just hope that Jalen Waddle's healthy? Like if mm-hmm. he's healthy, that just makes a world of difference for Tyree, but. Even so, like, this was just, like, a really good game, like, for, on both sides of the ball. Um, if the shame was in Germany, <laughs> I would have loved to see it, like, <laughs> back home in the U.S. Like, I don't like the fact that I had to see it at, like, 9.30 in the morning. But um, still, still a great game on both sides. What I thought was a good game going into the first half was the Bears and the Saints. It ended up being close and competitive, but just turnover after turnover after turnover. Like, Tyson Bajan just absolutely, like, just tank any chance. And I'm saying this as a Tyson Bajan fan. Bears fans, <laughs> calm down. He's not taking over for Justin Fields. Justin yes, Fields is, is a better quarterback. Tyson Bajan did some things from the pocket <laughs> that are better than Justin Fields. And my hope is that if Justin can play Thursday against the Panthers, obviously I'm predicting the Bears to win that one. Um, if Justin Fields can play, I hope. He took some lessons from like how Tyson Bajan read the field and got it out to his playmakers without hesitating. That was like a major problem with Justin's game, like in the beginning of the season, and it cost the team when they wanted Justin to play like a pocket passer. So they had to adjust and like move him out of the pocket and get him to that like creative mode. But if Justin still needs to learn to learn to win from the pocket, and I think. The blessing in disguise of the injury is he gets the chance to see, oh, how is Tyson Bajan operating the offense? How can Justin do this better? Where he's not hesitating on hitches. He's just letting that ball go within like a three-step drop and trusting his playmakers. And if Justin can do that, that's great. But back to the Saints game, what an absolute like get, absolute gem by both Taysom Hill and Paul Debo. I think they both were like the players of the games. and. Yeah, enough to be said. I'm going to go hide now. I'm going to grab my charger and charge my computer. <laughs> I'm going to hide because I don't want to talk about this game. Of course, Sam, yeah. what did you see? Um, Yeah, I mean, last week we talked, I think we talked about Taysom Hill and how the Bears' defense is, in a way, like the optimal defense to uh be really successful against. And so we saw Taysom Hill kind of ball out. I had him in one of my fantasy leagues. I gambled on the lack of pass rush from the Chicago Bears, uh, and it panned out for me in fantasy. And so, I mean, we saw that with Taysom Hill. Um, and then the kind of the trend I noticed as well is that basically when Alvin Kamara is, like, fully healthy and in playing the game, uh, Taysom Hill gets pretty decent opportunities. Um, and then, like, the only other time Taysom Hill really lacks opportunities is when a quarterback goes down and they kind of want him to be a reserve quarterback and not wanting him to get hurt, which obviously makes sense. But, um, <clears throat> yeah, that was really nice from Taysom Hill. Um, and then on the other side, though, Cole Komet was also, uh, balling out pretty hard. He was making some Did you see that catches. first touchdown catch he had? I did see that. Yeah, it was crazy, man. Ridiculous. Like, I, I get it. Tyron Matthews smaller than him, but, mm-hmm. like, that's a ball that shouldn't have been thrown by Bajan. That was the absolute, that was Komet winning the ball. hmm <clears throat> Yeah. Like, this season... I was really high on Komet. I thought that he had a really good opportunity to play uh, really good. And I, I don't know. I feel like it's kind of forgotten that he was a second-round pick by the Bears. And I think 
in that draft class, he may have been the first pick that they took. I don't remember exactly. I, they, I don't know if they had a first number that year or not, but um, I know everyone was surprised that they took tight end uh, in the second round there, but uh, it seems like, you know, they got their guy but this past couple of weeks. Just, I mean, it's even the season in general, uh, people have really put Komet really high on their own tight end board, saying that he is like borderline or he's really close to bordering that like elite tight end range, which uh, I'm sure Bears fans are all really happy about, you know, seeing one of their own homegrown drafted players that panned out actually on like a guy like Kevin White or something. I don't know. But, <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah. Tyson um, Badgen to the moon. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't go that far with Komet. And I'm saying this as a Bears fan. Like, I'd, I'd probably rather have Trey McBride, Dalton Kincaid, or Sam Laporta than Komet just because of, like, talent. Like, I think they might offer more in role. But, like, Komet's still a functional tight end. Um, and the Bears have a lot more problems than, like, him when it, co- when it comes to, like, generating offense. So, um like, talent preference, I wouldn't want Komet. I would rather want, like, three tight ends I mentioned there. Um, mm-hmm. But, like, he's – he had a really good game today. And, like, he stepped up completely. I know, like, at the beginning of the season, like, I was getting furious with, like, his blocking and, like, Chase Claypool's blocking on, like, short passes. It was, like, they gave, like, no effort whatsoever. <laughs> and um, they improved a lot, like, as the season progressed. So that was good to see. Um, uh, uh, one thing on Taysom Hill, like you mentioned it, I think the, he's one of the first players to have at least 10 passing touchdowns, 10 rushing touchdowns, and 10 receiving ch- uh, touchdowns in his career. I thought that was ridiculous. Like, how often are we going to ever see that in the league? Like, probably not ever. Mm-hmm. Like, maybe Mariota, if he's used that way, but like, I don't, I don't think he'll come close to that. Like, uh, like he just had this one play where like he passed, caught it, and ran for a touchdown in the playoffs. I remember seeing that against the Chiefs, and I thought it was like ridiculous that that mm-hmm. happened. But like the the point is, there's not many players of like Taysom Hill's archetype that can do that. Mm-hmm. So like, um, yeah, it sucks. I have Kamara in a lot of my leagues, <laughs> so it, it like he, it's kind of like the touchdown sealer from uh, that Taysom Hill is. But like. Mm-hmm. They're purposely using him in the red zone because, like, when you face a player like Taysom Hill, like, you don't know what he's going to do. So, like, it, it brings a lot more questions on the defensive side that you have to answer. So, mm-hmm. overall, <clears throat> great games by both both teams. Um, mm-hmm. Even though the Bears have a really bad record, I like the fact that they're competing. It says a lot about their coach and about the team. I am not on the fire Eber Flues train like a lot of people are. I think there's a lot more. The Bears need more talent, I think. And that was part of the reason why they traded for Sweat. And I was hoping the DJ Moore trade would be enough to move their offense in the upper tier. But, like, obviously the Justin Fields injury played a role in early offseason struggles were mm-hmm. not what I was expecting. But just have patience, Bears fans. I think the team's headed in the right direction. They're competing in the right way. They're not getting blown out all the time. So this is a good sign. <clears throat> yeah. Quickly, one last thing with Komet, though. Uh, yeah. He is second place amongst tight ends for uh, receiving touchdowns, and he's like 11th in yardage. And just from receiver tight end in general, uh, he's like technically like tied for fourth or something in terms of there's one guy that has eight, two guys that have seven receiving touchdowns, three guys with six touchdowns, and then he par- he's part of that next tier of. So he's been really t- uh, touchdown efficient this season, which. Yeah. I think it's really good in terms of like end zone tight play because I think he is slowly turning it. I mean, he may not be like the like the athletic freak that you maybe want from Trey McBride or guys like Kincaid, but in terms of like a solid, consistent red zone target, uh, I think that's excellent role for him in this offense, especially when you got guys that can stretch the field like DJ Moore. You got guys like Darnell Mooney, and you could even Tyler Scott, right? You have guys that can really move the ball down the field, and then he's your guy that's really steady in the end zone, which... Yeah, uh, no, I'm glad you brought that up, because, like, he he's playing really well right now. So, mm-hmm. all the credit in the world to him. Um, I guess what I'm talking... I'm talking about from, like, a team-building perspective. Um, I probably wouldn't want mm-hmm. Komet, like, compared to, like, other options. But, um, yeah, he is not... He's not the main problem 
on the team. He's having a mm-hmm. good season. Um, if you want to use him in the red zone, that's perfectly like what tight ends are supposed to be able to be used for because they're so versatile and it's hard to match up against a good tight end when used properly. So um, fair point. Um, no complaints there. As a Bears fan, I'm happy to hear that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. We'll start to get into the good games now. Cowboys and Eagles, highly anticipated. If the Cowboys were able to win this one, they'd inch closer into um, the division than catching up to the Eagles and also to that number one spot because everybody and their grandmother had the Eagles pegged as number one in the NFC coming into this season. And they're playing like it. Um, of course, Sam, what were your thoughts watching this game? This is a good one. <clears throat> yeah. Um, I didn't fully watch the game. I know a big complaint was like Eagles were kind of bailed out by refs at times, which – wouldn't necessarily surprise me. Um, is it is the Eagles after all? I mean, they're they are like a top team in the NFL. You kind of get those calls, but um, overall, I do think that <clears throat> oh, no, both teams did. Uh, they they both played good football. Dak Prescott the past couple weeks has played really unbelievably well, um, which I mean, it's a good sign for Cowboys fans. I think, especially with it's kind of an easier stretch of games. He's upcoming uh, next, like three. Four-ish weeks, I think. They have, like, a bit of an easier schedule. Um, but this is really a key game for them to have one um, because now that they've lost this game, it just puts them further back in the race to try to catch up. And so winning this game plus having the easier schedule would have been a really nice opportunity, especially with the Eagles having a bit of a more difficult schedule the next three, four weeks as well. But um, with this loss, I mean, we kind of talked about it last week, but, like, a loss, this was a huge game for the Cowboys that they needed to win. and. Um, obviously it really, it puts them back farther than I, like, than most teams would be after just a single year loss, even at midway through the season. Yeah. I mean, and they were so close. They were like two plays away from like changing how that last possession goes. Mm-hmm. Like literally they had a touchdown stolen from them on a fourth down try where, um, who was it? Ferguson. We, we had talked about him earlier. He was having a great, a great season as of late. He is literally a body turn away from scoring that touchdown. And Dak Prescott, the mm-hmm. two-point conversion, is literally one right foot away from scoring. That's like mm-hmm. eight points right there, like nine points right there. That easily swing in the balance. It affects how the Cowboys go in philosophy with their last drive because now they could just score a field goal instead of a touchdown. And they don't have to force it down the field. And they were really close. Um, but with that said, Eagles just squeaked by. I think Eagles have a secondary problem um, that's going unnoticed. And I think it's they're, they're getting exposed. C.D. Lamb had an absolute phenomenal game. Um, he was just tearing everybody apart. I think he had like 10 receptions for 170 yards. Or something like that. Yeah, he's balling. Yeah, it was insane. Yeah. Um, and I really liked how the broadcast talked about, like, how Tony Pollard is not, like, as efficient as he was now that he has a full workload. Because it's a perfect example on why guys like Zeke are important and why Tony Pollard was, like, having so much success last year. Yeah, sure, it's it's good if you have, like, Tony Pollard as a changeup and, like, he's having all these explosive plays. But you can't expect that to happen when he's getting the ball all the time because you're expecting him to be a workhorse back. I think they really needed that realization where, like, oh – Let's let Zeke get the hard yards. He's really good at getting the four or five yards that are, oh, going to get him labeled as washed or he's not good anymore. But it's going to keep the offense on schedule. And then when you need an explosive play, you don't have to rely on C.D. Lamb all the time. And I thought they underutilized Cooks. Um, Ferguson had a great game. He had an absolute great game in the mm-hmm. first, first and second half. Like, if you guys haven't scooped him up yet, I would. Um, I think he's going to have games where, like, he's utilized like Dalton Schultz would be on the Dallas Cowboys in years past. Um, great guy to get. Um, mm-hmm. You're welcome. <laughs> but I wanted to do a Dak Prescott regular season check because I know, like, at the beginning of the season, he's he said he's not going to throw more than 10 interceptions. We're halfway through the mm-hmm. season. Cowboys are 5-3. and three. Dak has 2,011 yards, 13 touchdowns, 5 interceptions. And a 67.5 QBR, which is fourth. Um, to his credit, he's played extremely efficient. I have no doubt in my mind he can keep this up, um, the way he played against the Eagles. And I thought another thing that was interesting, unrelated, though, was I think I heard on the broadcast that 
the Cowboys haven't had a lead change like ever throughout the season, except like one other time. Like the second time they exchanged leads with the Eagles, it was the second time all season that ever happened to them. And that was like absolutely wild to think about. Like they swing of their games, either they're blowing out opponents or like they're getting blown out themselves. And it was that. That was the story of the Cowboys were a lot of times during the season. And a game like this shows like they can compete with any team in the league. But like in true Cowboys fashion, are they going to Cowboy as the end of the season comes out? <laughs> Meaning they're going to lose the pivotal game because of something? Or are they going to get the job done? It remains to be seen. It truly does. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. CD Lamb, though. Yeah. Like I forgot to mention him too, but. <clears throat> Uh, he's playing so good. Again, we talked, I talked about him a bunch last week. Um, just mentioning like where he was drafted, what his expectations were. Um, you know, especially coming from like the school, he's like the star guy from Oklahoma. Um, and he had, he's like a phenomenal, just overall like wide receiver build too, which I mean, kind of goes to show like that plus just his elite playmaking ability. We saw him get the ball here a bunch and he's really efficient at like, you know, running or ca- getting open, getting the catch. Um, if he had managed to, you know, get that extra couple yards, that would have been another touchdown on his name. Uh, <clears throat> and we, without that, you know, he continues his like little streak of, or not streak, but his uh, seasonal trend of not having like any touchdowns this year with still only having two games catching a touchdown. That's um, wild. Which is <clears throat> it's pretty bizarre because like, uh, just looking at the last three games, in terms of receiving yardage, he has, what, like, three, almost 500 yards, like, just under that, I think, in the so last three, three games. games. Well, because, yeah, well, because they had week seven by, so week six, eight, and nine, he has 117 yards, 158 yards, and 191 yards. Wow. And he's only caught two touchdowns, both of them being in one game against the Rams. That's ridiculous. Wow. <laughs> wow. Wow. Like, get CD more involved, please. Please. And then, please, yeah, I'm begging and then, you. It's not like yeah, then, I get it. He's at 192 <laughs> yards, but you got to get him involved in the red zone, man. Yeah. And then, like, week one and two, he also has 77 yards and a 143 yard game. Uh, both those also don't have a touchdown. So, wow. He's, he's coming in clutch with the really yards. Efficient, yeah. Here, so. <clears throat> yeah. It's almost, it almost feels like. I mean, obviously they're different players, but like Julio Jones, where uh, Julio Jones would get ridiculous amount of targets, ridiculous amount of yards, but his touchdowns would be like ridiculously low at the end of the season. I see Justin Jefferson without the touchdowns, man. I really do. I mm-hmm. really like the yardage sort of reminds me of Justin Jefferson, like over this mm-hmm. past week. Because like if we were saying, oh, Justin Jefferson had like 190 yards, we wouldn't bat an eye. Like mm-hmm. that's annoying for him. Like, <laughs> He's always like averaging 150 or 170 yards, but yeah, you got a fair point with the Julio Jones on the touch. I did want to talk about Jalen Hurts though, because mm-hmm. in short, he is a baller. Like I remember this one shot where I thought his knee caved in. And I was like, I was like scared. I didn't want to think worst case scenario, but I thought that was a long term injury waiting to happen. And he just came back in the next was like he was slow to get up. Obviously, that's a tough mm-hmm. hit to take. As is, he's coming in wearing a knee base, and he's after halftime. He's like, "Oh, I'm fine." After the game, "Oh, I'm fine." Just casually throws like a streak route to Devontae Smith with like mm-hmm. barely any room for error, and just completes a touchdown on the very next possession. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, "Yeah, he's him." <laughs> but just want to say that yeah. about Jalen Hurts. Yeah, did you see like the post game interview about like what he was like talking about like coming back from the injury or whatever this last week or during the game? No, nah, what did uh, you say? I thought he just said I'm fine, right? Well, he was like, yeah, for like for this city, for this team, there's nothing I wouldn't do for them. Like, and I'm like, what a baller! Like, like that is the man dude, you want at dude, your quarterback. You better, you, you, like, you better respect that man. I'm sorry. Like, if you ever, if you ever talk down on Jalen Hurts. Like mm-hmm. you do not deserve to be a Philadelphia Eagles fan. Yeah. He is more than enough for that city, and be grateful. Yeah, yeah. yeah I can. I I see this Eagles team like it'd be like winning at least one or two Super Bowls. Uh, you know, in the next couple of years or so, I think just with, they could have won the Super Bowl last year. It was literally one possession <laughs> right? away. Like, like they're they're right there. 
as long as they solve the secondary problems I talked about. Yeah, he's like, I think if he wins like a Super Bowl or two, like he, I mean, like, he's already borderline, like, on, like at least on trajectory to be like a Philly great, you know? And yeah. uh, I think, you know, even like with the Super Bowl, like this season or next season. You see what like, they did with Doug, uh, Doug Peterson and Nick Foles for getting them from their, their Super uh-huh. Bowl? Yeah, like, every, imagine like, that with Jalen Hurts with two Super Bowls. Like, yeah, it would be ridiculous. Um, yeah, what other note? Just hope Goddard's okay. He took a nasty hit. Um, mm-hmm. I, I, I don't know who it was. Like, so one, I think it was Gerard Bland who like shoved him down, looked rough. Um, he's gonna be out for a couple weeks, I think, but I hope yeah. he gets healthy. That's a massive loss for the Eagles offense. Um, mm-hmm. but let's move on to the Bills and Bengals. I thought this was going to be a really good game. Um, thank goodness, like, DeMar Hamlin uh, is still there. That's the first thought that crossed my mind. Um, like, still on the Bengals. He wasn't playing in this game, but, like, you'd love to see it. You'd love to see, like, the camaraderie that brought that brought about in the entire stadium. And um, – but this game wasn't as close as it looked. What did you, what did you see, Corsia? Yeah? Oh, <clears throat> I think – at least what we're seeing is the Bengals each week that Joe Burrow is healthy, they're getting like further and further into uh, their postseason form that I think everybody's expecting them to be in. <clears throat> and again, I feel like, like this was like a partial worry of mine at the beginning of the season that like of all the elite teams that could potentially fall off, it might be the bills. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I still like will revere them as an elite team, even if they go around 500, like, there's still a team you can't really, like, uh, you know, ignore or, like, kind of take take with a grain of salt in terms of, like, saying, oh, this is going to be an easy 500 team. No, <clears throat> Bills are really a dominant offense. But I think, again, we see, like, the inconsistencies uh, with the offense in terms of, <clears throat> uh, you know, Josh Allen leading the charge in terms of, like, running the ball for the Bills. Uh, and then, like, as a passer... Uh, there's a lot that you could have hoped that he could have done better with. You know, he went 26 for 38, which is like, okay. I mean, it's 12 incompletions, which isn't the worst. But then from that, he only gets like the 258 yards, a touchdown and an interception. And uh, when you're, you know, playing a high profile opponent like the Bengals, uh, you need at least someone on your offense to be a bit more efficient, which, you know, leads to the Bills not winning the game and they're technically not in the playoff uh room now i guess with the uh Bengals beating them here which i don't think a lot of people saw happening to the bills at this point in the season but you look at like again the Bengals side of the field right or side of the ball where joe burrow he misses just about the same amount of uh throws he was 31 for 44 but he's a lot more efficient he throws 350 yards two touchdowns and zero interceptions and you know the lack of turnovers he just their running game was kind of garbage too, but just, I mean, just there was somebody on that Bengals offense that was able to kind of like click, get into the groove, which ends up, I think, being able to set the pace for the game rather than the Bills trying to set the pace. Yeah, um, that's a really good point, like you brought up, because I feel like, like the Bills are just stubborn, like offensively. I feel like they like refuse to run the ball enough times to help like Allen out. And, like, Allen refuses to play, like, differently. Like, oh, I'll say this. Over the past two weeks, he has relied on Khalil Shakir and Dalton Kincaid a lot more, which I'm super happy about. I think they finally realized, like, they have other guys besides Diggs that can win consistently in man coverage. Mm-hmm. Whereas with, like, Gabe Davis, he's a solid player. <laughs> but, like, I keep saying this about him, and it's not meant to be a dig. Like, no pun intended. But, um, like, you have to allocate a lot of resources to get Gabe Davis the ball. So, like, what I'm talking about is, like, you'll have to call screens or, like, you'll have to run plays where you're isolating Gabe Davis using picks. Things like that. Like, where you have to schematically call plays for him rather than say, okay, Stefan Diggs, you're running a dig route. You're going against... Um, Ch- Chidobi Az- Az- um, I can't Awuzie. say his name. Awuzie. I said Azuye, but Awuzie. Um, 
You're going against him. But, oh, yeah, you might get your head knocked off by Jermaine Pratt. Like, on your way there. Find a way to win. And he just wins every time. Like, there's a difference between, like, the types of plays you call for Stephon Diggs and Gabe Davis. But not necessarily with Khalil Shakir and Dalton Kincaid. Because Kincaid and Shakir can win on quick-hitting routes where they can beat their man. And they have different types of techniques to do that. You saw that with Kincaid. He got, like, 10 receptions. Khalil Shakir, every time you notice. Like, I don't think he has many stats as, as many yards. But, like, you saw him winning, like, down the field, like, mm-hmm. intermediate routes with more efficiency. And that's going to help out the Bills' offense a lot because it's going to keep them on schedule. It's going to make them less predictable. Now, one major issue, and I was hoping they would solve this when they added James Cook and, like, gave him the starting role. It's a more efficient running game. Until that happens, I'm not keeping them mm-hmm. on the top of the AFC list. And – this is coming from a person who had the Bills like going to the Super Bowl like the past two seasons, and it didn't work mm-hmm. out. I think the Bengals are clearly above them. This game showed that. Like the Bengals know who they are. They know who their like where their strengths are. And even if you try to shut them down, what do they do? They throw it to the tight ends. Like mm-hmm. all the tight ends had a really good game. Like Er Smith, everybody's favorite breakout player, finally broke out in this <laughs> game. But like you saw guys like Tanner Hudson like do some things and and more like. The Bengals just have more ways to win. And, like, they remind me of the Patriots of old, the way they play uh-huh. and the way a house, like, high IQ their quarterback is. And Joe Burrow is still a really good scrambler. I'm just throwing out all these misconceptions <laughs> down. Like, his pocket management is as good as Purdy's, and his scrambles are good. They're good enough to win and extend the plays. They're good. So... Just want to highlight all that. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. And I think, I mean, obviously Damian uh, Harris, right? He went down earlier in the season, so yeah. that could be attributed. And so that was a huge bump. Signed, Yeah. <clears throat> and they just signed Leonard Fournette. And so we'll see how, like, actually in shape he is for football. But they got to um, call the plays. Like, they got to call the running play. Like, the Bills have been notoriously, yeah. like, pass heavy, regardless of mm-hmm. who's been at running back. Yeah, but yeah, we'll see what happens. I mean, also, I mean, the Bills historically, I mean, the not historically, but like the past, like, what, like six, seven years ish or so, the running back hasn't really necessarily been an elite player as well, which it's been Josh Allen. You, you still got to call like the plays, but it also yeah. hurts that you haven't been able to really land a true elite uh, guy that defenses have to like kind of scheme for um when it's like what like Devin Singletary James Cook uh I don't even know who the guy before Singletary was off the top of my head they have I mean they have like what uh Zach Moss or Frank like Gore a, maybe right Frank Gore maybe like these aren't guys you have to uh really I like this stage of Frank plan Gore's for. yeah you're right <clears throat> yeah well obviously yeah prime Frank Gore is a completely different story but <laughs> like a million year old Frank Gore like he he's probably a better option now than what they're doing right now with the run game in all honesty though. But um, yeah, I think, I mean, this last season I was kind of talking about it. And then like this season, I've kind of mentioned it a few times, but I think the bills are a team that really should look for an elite running back to bring in, um, you know, this off season, whether it be through the draft, um, you know, taking literally spending first round uh, capital on a running back, just trying to get your guy, or spending the big bucks trading for someone. Um, I even had brought up that, you know, at the midseason mark, they should have traded for a running back that's kind of a high profile guy if there were, you know, guys on the market that they thought they could afford in terms of capital, uh, the trade capital in general. But they didn't do that. And no, I think we're kind Leonard, of saying, like for Leonard Fournette could be that guy. <laughs> yeah, he okay. could. But also he hasn't played football in a minute. I know there's talk he it's like the historical issue is like him being in and out of shape pretty yeah frequently um and so if you if you get in shape playoff lenny you know it's i think it'll be fine for them but if it's not playoff lenny you're getting here then it's you might as well roll out latavius murray still on all your run plays and and hope for the best yep i mean they could they could trade make a run for aj Dillon. i think that would be a really good move for the bills 
Um, try and trade for Montgomery. I doubt Detroit's going to let him go. Um, mm-hmm. and I was thinking of running backs in the NFC North, and I just thought of Cam Akers. That was brutal, like getting a second Achilles injury. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, I think, yeah, he – It's his other leg, but, like, still, <clears throat> like, that's tough. That's got to be, like – Yeah, I think it's, like, there. yeah, window of, like, being, like, a full-time starter is basically zero at this stage in his career, despite it being him seeing so young. Um, at best, I see, yeah, Cam Akers uh, just being kind of like a career backup now. That's like a decent change of pace potential kind of guy. But it's kind of it's a shame that he just made such tough injuries so early in his career. Yeah. And he overcame it like last year. It was, it was, mm-hmm. it was really fun to see. I thought he was going to have a breakout season with the Rams and just like a crazy season for mm-hmm. him. Like wish yeah. him all the best. Um, on a positive note, let's talk about five players that uh, five players that shine. I cheated a little bit with my list, so you'll see as I okay. get forward to it. But um, the first guy I have up for you is, if I can get it up, CJ Stroud. Another uh, name we've been talking about earlier. Yeah. Matt is a baller. Like, his, uh, I was looking at his like, touchdown interception ratio this season, and I'm like, this is a guy that looks like a seasoned veteran of the game. Um, and like going into the before season bit, I thought that he was like a decent, uh, he's going to a decent team. I thought the Texans would actually be pretty competitive this year, but I didn't think that he'd be playing this good of football. Um, clear offensive rookie of the year candidate. If he keeps this up, a potential MVP candidate his rookie season, which um, is insane. Texans got their guy for the next decade, basically. Um, and and on that note, too, he's he's doing this from the pocket. Like, mm-hmm. he wants to throw first. He's not looking to scramble. And mm-hmm. to those of you that think the age of pocket passer is dead, stop it. It's not. There are ways to win from the pocket in the NFL, even in the modern, um, in the modern <laughs> league now. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah, but uh, one last thing about him: that last drive of his, pure magic. Like absolutely insane. Like, like he I was down. Seconds. Yeah, he, yeah, and it was like the first couple. I'm like, okay, good. He, he's he's making some plays down the field, but he's really losing time. But then I also saw they were like on the Buccaneer within the in the Buccaneers fifty, and I'm like, oh shoot, like this is winnable range. And you know what do they do? They he, they they score and uh he's looking really good he yeah he's he's a great talent i think a lot of teams wished or not a lot of teams but you know the panthers i'm sure are wishing that they had a cd shot over bryce young granted i do think that cd shot would struggle a lot more with the panthers which is how awful the panthers offense outside of Thielen looks but that's just me um but I would you, bryce oh go ahead but yeah, no. Yeah, got, gonna... yeah, my guy, it's the other side of the field for you. I got Baker Mayfield. Um, he's not a scrub. Like he looked good yesterday. Like that's like that's just awful. Like, well, what was the score of that game? Because it was it was close. I it was like 39, 37. Like, if you're up like 37, 33, and like it's 49 seconds left. Like you've done a good job leading your offense, like <laughs> uh, like getting getting a drive, scoring, making sure your defense is a position where they can win the game. Like Baker did everything he could to win that game, and it just didn't work out for him. I think mm-hmm. um, it's a really credit to Dave Canales, but also Baker deserves some credit. Mm-hmm. Um, like he could have had like two more touchdowns to his box score. Like he missed one to Rashad White and one to Mike Evans, and. It was, like, this close. Like, if Mike Evans had full possession of the ball, like, he would have had a nice touchdown. And that was just the margin of error in that game. I think he's good for, like, Mike Evans. He's good for, like, Chris Godwin occasionally. He's good for this offense. Like, I don't think the Buccaneers are going to finish, like, in the bottom 10 where they're, like, in position to get Caleb Williams or Drake May Mm -hmm. or, like, Michael Penix, who's we gotta start talking about him. He's looking really nice. Mm-hmm. Um, but like I think they're fine with that. 
if I'm like the Buccaneers, like it's just a matter of like retooling that offensive and defensive lines. Mm-hmm. And once you do that, like you're straight. Yeah, yeah. It's like with the way. I mean, it's unfortunately lost like four games in a row now. But uh, yeah, the way the offense has been running this season, a lot of people are saying that Mike Evans is the for sure leaving the Buccaneers type of player this upcoming off season. But um, I wouldn't be surprised, you know, if he signs like a two to four year extension. Just with how well, I mean, the, the team's playing this season so far. Or, yeah, just the offense is rolling so far. The division's up for grabs. They could take it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, my next guy is another quarterback. Um, I think you guys should really tune into the episode last week because we foreshadowed sure this, but Joe Burrow. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, if you got scared off by Joe Burrow early in the season with his calf injury, I think you're kind of a bozo. Um, I mean, his history kind of shows that Joe Burrow is a good player. They've been a good team. Um, they just had struggles that early in the season. Um, and we see, you know, this most recent week, uh, jo- prime Joe Burrow, basically, in the fact that this offense is rolling, even with, like, the chase uh, issues and whatnot. You know, I mean, you got guys like T. Higgins who – Almost got tra- or not really almost got traded, but looked like he might be traded, uh, balling out this last week. And we seen you know Tyler Boyd's able to make plays. Um, Joe Burrow, he's a stud. There's nothing you really we should have worried about in the get go. Um, but you know, glad he's balling out. There's a reason why I had this team going 15 and two in my season predictions. They look uh-huh. like they could be anybody right now, except maybe a team in their own division, the Ravens. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then for you, I got another quarterback, uh, Josh Dobbs. It's a quarterback show. Um, <laughs> did you see some of the post game like interview questions from like Kevin Stefanski? Like he was trying to like onboard the offense to Josh Dobbs in the middle of a game, and this yeah. guy comes in for Jaron Hall, leads a huge comeback win over the Atlanta Falcons, and during that time, he completes twenty or thirty passes for one hundred fifty eight yards, two touchdowns. Rushing seven times for 66 yards and another score. Like, he lost two fumbles in that game. But then he goes ahead, like, has a game-winning drive with 27 seconds left. And it's just absolutely ridiculous. Like, Mm -hmm. I get it. Like, it's Atlanta. But still, like, that was, like, this guy was playing at the Cardinals just a week before. Mm -hmm. And, And, like, all of a sudden, like, he takes over for a team that just lost their QB to an Achilles injury. Lost a running back to an Achilles injury in the same game. Lost a quarterback to another injury in that game. Steps up. Leaves the team to win. Um, like, baller. Baller. And, like, you have to remember, this guy came from the Steelers organization when, like, Matt Canada was calling plays, and people have written him off. And just now this season, we've been, like, all over with, like, Matt Canada for how he's called plays mm-hmm. and, like, completely overlooked the fact that Josh Dobbs is once there. And, like, he's the mm-hmm. classic quarterback, like, journeyman that's, like, balling in the league now. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah. And do you know the fun fact about him, uh, that Josh Dobbs, that he's also an aerospace engineer? Like, Yeah, I saw that. That's crazy. <laughs> like, no. And not only that, like, his processing speed is insane. Like, he can pick up technical details like that. I'm mm-hmm. not surprised, like, he picked up um, – I mean, I am kind of surprised, like, that quickly. But, like, the technical, <laughs> like – onboarding from the Vikings to, like, understand what plays are being called and, like, what text to run. Like, that's that's special. It takes an engineer yeah. to do that, I guess. Mm-hmm. I guess so. Um, third guy for you, Paulson Adiba. <clears throat> um, Paulson Adiba, he's a guy that I've liked pretty well. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think that – I mean, I don't know, I guess, how much IP I'm going into this season, but, like, me personally, I had heard of him before. I liked – a little bit of what he had, like, just from what I've seen in the past. And, um, I mean, he's kind of shut out this season. He, uh, I think last, these last two weeks, he played really, really good football. Obviously, this last week against the Bears, uh, you know, recording two interceptions and having a forced fumble. Um, again, it's one of those types of games where you're like, you can't ask more from uh, a defensive player than, like, literally what they showcased in that game. And... <clears throat> Um, I think it's a really nice piece to have, especially when you have Marshawn Lattimore on the other side. Um, and the fact that this is like a, he's like a type of player that 
you also have to watch out when uh, you're like, you know, reading the defense and kind of seeing what the defense is giving you. Because a lot of times, you know, it's like a team will have a really elite number one guy and then the number two guy will be pretty hit or miss. Um, and where you can just kind of abuse him if you got your guy over there. But you're talking about cornerbacks, like number two. Yeah, 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 and cornerbacks. <clears throat> and so um, Adebo, he's kind of really stepped up this season in the fact that uh, you can't just like willy nilly throw it to him uh, when your top guy's getting covered by the number one corner. Yeah, and like some of those throws that Bajan threw for interceptions, like they it was like right guy, but like great play on the ball. Like, it wasn't that Bajan was being stupid. It was just, like, that's a tough play to make from a cornerback. Mm-hmm. So, like, props to him. He had a great game. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I had to have it in my team, though. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then for my next guy for you, I got uh, Gus Edwards. Um, are you okay if I take up your other guy, too, that you had? He was also on the Ravens, E.T. Mitchell? <clears throat> yeah, yeah. E.T. Mitchell's my other guy, so you can combine the two. Yeah. So... Fortunately, I went about, I went up against Gus Edwards in like two or three of my leagues, and he absolutely went off. So like I don't like talking about this. <laughs> um, in week nine, he only had ninety percent of the snaps. Um, he had eighteen percent of the routes, but like inside the five, he got like fifteen percent of the snaps. Had two touchdowns. Um, they clearly like to use Gus Edwards in that role when they don't want Lamar Jackson to like be ball handling the ball so much there. Um, Compare that to Kate Mitchell, he had 17% of the snaps, so close, and then like 24% of the rushing time. So he had more rushing. Um, he's used a lot more in like the short down and distance and like targets per route run when he's targeted on routes compared to Edwards. Um, but it was still, um, Edwards didn't have any targets in the receiving game, but like still, it's interesting to look at like how both of these players are being used, like at least from last week. Um, Great for the Ravens to have this after losing J.K. Dobbins early in the season. I think it gives them more diversity. And that whole team is, like, balling on, like, both sides of the ball. They're looking like one of the best teams in the league. Yeah. And what's crazy, too, is, like, Keaton Mitchell's, like, an undrafted free agent, I think. Um, and the fact that – Yeah. I don't know. I mean, his college team kind of speaks for itself in, as well in the fact that, I mean, he was a baller in college. Uh, and so, like, I mean, I, he's been on my radar throughout the season as well. I know he started out on IR, and that's why we didn't see much of him at all because, I mean, he was out. But, uh, you know, he I think he got activated last week, didn't really get the ball, like, at all. And then this week he, you know, really – he was able to see some field time, which is really good for him. Cool. Um, my fourth guy for you is Kenny Moore. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Another cornerback had a great week. Um, yeah. against Bryce Young, a quarterback we talked about just briefly a second ago. Um, <clears throat> yeah, this is this was actually an insane game. Like, I know he is like more of like a nickel kind of build, um, and so he's not good, he's not always going to be the one making these like highlight plays. But uh, two pick sixes is pretty ridiculous, especially in just a singular That's game. That's rare. That was like, how often do you see that? Yeah, he's just like pick six in general is just super rare and so to see him you know do it twice in a single game is is pretty nice um i mean i think even from the start of the season just the colts uh yeah the colts defense in general they had a lot of you know good playmakers that i think we we pointed out and um each week i mean there's opportunities for i think anybody on this defense to ball out and this week is a great week for kenny moore i think that um i mean you see that like outside of this in terms of the interceptions uh, he had one against the Rams a couple weeks ago. Um, but then outside of that, he's been kind of quiet, at least in the interception game. I don't really know about his passes defended and, uh, you know, QBR, QB rating against him or not. not. But, um, I mean, good guys make good plays, and we see that here. Absolutely. Like, <clears throat> he's always been, like, one of the best slot cornerbacks in the NFL. Mm-hmm. Not surprised, like, that he went off last week. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then I guess my last guy for you then here is, well, not guy, but it's a group of guys, the uh, Houston wide receiver room plus their tight ends. Yeah. Um, I'm glad you mentioned Dalton Schultz as well because three of the receivers, like including the tight end on the Texans, had over 100 yards in this game. Absolutely. Did. Like, CJ Stroud was balling, but I just want to read out these stats for you. Tank Dell, six receptions, 114 yards, 
um, two touchdowns. Dalton Schultz, 11 receptions, 130 yards, and a touchdown. And Noah Brown, six receptions, 153 yards, and a touchdown. These guys balled out last week. And, like, that's not even their number one wide receiver. Let's look at uh, Nico Collins. He had three receptions, 54 yards, and a touchdown. Respectable day. And, like, wow. Wow. Like, they, Bobby Slowick working wonders. CJ Stroud is him. But, like, these guys know how to get open. Like, I think Tank Dell erased any doubts that he can separate on the NFL level at this point of his, like, rookie season, which is absolutely wild. Dalton Schultz, like, is proving, like, oh, no, he's just not a system tight end from the Cowboys. Um, Noah Brown, like, also another Cowboys guy, balling out, like, showed he was underutilized over there. Mm -hmm. And not much to say, like, they're all great separators. Mm -hmm. They know how to win against the defense. Like, this is a team on the rise. And we haven't even, like, we haven't talked about some of our sleepers on this team, like Xavier Hutchinson and, like, John Mechie. This team, they're going to be a threat two, three to four years from now. I promise you. This team is really good. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of cheated here as well. I didn't really give, like, mm -hmm. one player. I actually didn't yeah. give a player here. Um because I didn't know, like, mm -hmm. this defense has been balling out the past two weeks. So I want to give credit to Mike McDonald. I want to hear your thoughts on him. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> That's the uh, Ravens defensive coordinator, right? Yep. <clears throat> yeah. Um, Ravens, I mean, Ravens as a team were really just firing on all cylinders. Uh, they didn't really let up anywhere. And, I mean, they won 37-3 against the Seahawks. I think a lot of people thought this was going to be a closer game. Yeah. Um, and <clears throat> yeah, I think, yeah, this Ravens defense as a whole is, did a great job at just keeping them off balance. Um, like I think I was reading up on, uh, some of like the things that happened throughout the game. And I know Geno Smith was getting sacked quite a bit. Um, and then I think he had like three or four passes that got batted, which is uh, pretty crazy to see. No, I mean, normally you'll see like maybe like a highlight one or two bat. A balls get batted in a game, even from both sides, you know? And then the fact that Geno Smith was just getting kind of eat, uh, getting eaten alive, basically. It was a show that I guess the Seahawks offensive line really just kind of disappearing in the game. And I think, I mean, if you look at a lot of these other games that have stark uh, differences in the scoring or just even low scoring in general, uh, poor offensive line really comes to showcase, show there and um, just their offensive line getting beaten. So I think that, you know, the Ravens just were really smart to capitalize on, uh, you know, pushing really hard with their front seven, making sure that they didn't op allow any run lanes to open up, um, which the Seahawks are like one of the top rushing teams in the NFL right now. Um, yeah, so, you know, blocking those run holes. And then when they get opportunities to pass the ball, just kind of swallow up that offensive line to get to Geno Smith because, um Outside of that, like, what, like 50-yard pass to DK Metcalf, uh, there isn't really that much room for that Seahawks offense to get anywhere, which, uh, which is really impressive by that whole Ravens defense. Yeah, and really, like, we talk about, like, Ben Johnson trying to get, like, interviews uh, this season and, like, Shane Baldwin to a lesser extent with the Seahawks. Like, it's absolutely wild to think that Mike McDonald's defense has hold both teams to like under 10 points combined combined it's absolutely ridiculous he's a guy that i think is going to get a lot of head coaching interviews and is going to be on the top of the list like he's going to be like the brandon staley of coaching candidates this upcoming season and yeah. like for good reason like the you need to utilize all the defensive players you've had like patrick queen brocon smith marlon humphrey like you need to use all those guys well and he's done a phenomenal job nothing more you can say about it well, Koshan, great job today. That wraps mm -hmm. up our week nine analysis. Um, quick thoughts. Who do you have winning Thursday night? Oh, let's see. <clears throat> it is – I'll have the Panthers winning, obviously. Bryce of course. Well, why didn't I expect win. anything different? Um, I'm obviously going with the Bears. Um, in our dynasty league, Koshan has nicknamed himself after the Carolina Panthers. Um, mm -hmm. So that, that, should be, that should be a fun watch. Yeah. Um, 
But just yeah, kidding. Gotta, but you guys can skip that yeah. game if you don't want to see it. Hopefully, <laughs> Justin Fields comes back. But um, <laughs> yeah, uh, hopefully the Bears get another win. Um, but if not, you guys can follow us on Instagram. We should be having a basketball episode recorded later tonight, so those videos should be out uh, tomorrow or two days from now. You can follow us at aman.a.mission. Thank you, guys. Have a great night. We'll see you next week for Week 10. Peace. Peace out.